Hello, Rupert. Hello. Thank you for receiving us for this interview. No, I'm pleased to mm -hmm. see you here. Uh, you are known uh, for many things, but one of the mm, notions or theories which is associated the most with uh, your name is um, the idea of um, morphogenetic fields and morphic re resonance. And um, just for our general audiences, maybe a few words, what is it? What it's like? What's it about? I'll start with morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is about memory in nature. What I'm saying is that in the whole universe and the whole of nature, there is a kind of memory um, that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. In conventional science, people assume that all the laws of nature were fixed at the moment of the Big Bang, like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code. Um, I'm saying that in the radically evolutionary universe that we live in, uh, the laws themselves evolve, and in fact, they're more like habits. And this means that um, evolution is much more creative than we usually think of, because uh, it's not just governed by fixed laws. It's everything is evolving. Each species of animal or plant has a collective memory. Every individual contributes to it and draws upon it. So inheritance, according to this theory, is not just a matter of genes. Genes enable organisms to make the right proteins. Epigenetic modifications change the expression of the genes. But at most of inheritance depends on morphic resonance, on a kind of memory of form and of habit. So the instincts of animals with, that they inherit from their ancestors, like the ability of a spider to spin a web, or of a cuckoo to migrate to the right place uh, in the autumn. Um, these instincts are given by morphic resonance, this kind of memory. And the most radical part of this theory is that uh, resonance occurs between similar patterns of activity. That's the basis of morphic resonance. It's across time. It's a resonance across time. That's the hypothesis that I have for this memory in nature. It depends on similarity. So if I ask who is the most similar person to me in the past, the answer is me. Uh, we're all most similar to ourselves. Every organism is most similar to itself. So the most important resonance acting on any organism is from its own past. And that means that uh, memory, even individual memory, my memory, your memory, um, is happening by resonance. It's not stored in the brain. The standard view is that memory is stored in the brain as molecules or modified nerve endings or something like that. People haven't found memories in the brain. They've looked for them, can't find them. They just assume they have to look harder. I don't think they're there. I think that's why they haven't found them. Um, the brain, I think, works more like a TV receiver than a video recorder. It's tuning in to the past by morphic resonance. And morphic resonance works through organizing fields uh, in the development of form in plants and animals. They're called morphogenetic fields, form-shaping fields. These fields also organize the activity of the nervous system, and uh, they also organize social groups like flocks of birds or schools of fish. All of these kinds of fields have memory within them, and the generic name for all these fields is morphic fields. Morphic comes from the Greek word meaning form or shape. So uh, morphic resonance gives us a completely different way of understanding nature, which fits the facts much better than the conventional uh, approach. But for many people, it's an unfamiliar idea. And of course, it's very controversial within science. What uh, kind of evidence you... Well, some, of course, you cannot discuss all the evidence, but some parts of it may be one example of evidence for uh, such field or uh, resonance? Well, I'll give two. Uh, mm -hmm. If you make a new chemical for the first time and you crystallize it, it usually takes a long time before you can form crystals, months, sometimes years. That's because this is a new form in nature. It hasn't existed before. But when chemists make the same compound over and over again, it gets easier to crystallize all around the world. And I think that's because a new habit is building up. Chemists admit that this is happening, 
but they say, well, it must be because of dust particles from previous crystals being blown around the world in, in the air. Uh, I'm saying it will still happen even if you filter out dust particles. A second example is rats learning a new trick. Uh, there have actually been experiments on this, a very long series of experiments. If rats learn a new trick in Moscow, for example, then rats all around the world, in London, in Paris, in Berlin, in New York, should be able to learn the same trick quicker because the rats have learned it in Russia. And there's already evidence that this actually happens. Um, learning itself seems to be transferred by morphic resonance without the need for the rats to teach the other rats without any physical contact. Um, they're just picking this up from a kind of collective rat memory. And it depends on similarity. <coughs> the rats should be of the same breed. It should be the same problem they're trying to solve. Um, so anyway, these are some examples. And uh, human learning should also work in the same way. It should be easier to learn things that other people have already learned, like computer programming, skateboarding, windsurfing, and so on. Oh, one of the um, things which fascinated me, for instance, is when a surgeon performs the operation, his uh, movements are very precise. Or when uh, I do a lot of uh, workshops, when I get into the uh, kind of state of flow, uh, working with the um, field of the group, uh, it seems as if I tap into some kind of field. Uh, do you think it's somehow related to, the, or could it be related to these morphic fields? Well, I think so, yes. I think that these, um, the, a surgeon, when he's doing an operation, if it's a standard operation, of course, he'll have his own memories from previous, his own experience. But if it's a standard operation, many other surgeons have done, then this should be easier to learn in the first place, and it might make it easier to do. Um, and I think that um, in the context of a social group, there are two things. First of all, there's the memory of previous groups learning the same thing that should make it easier. Uh, there's also the way that when groups come together, when you get a group feeling that there's the, the collective field of the group can help this process. So, you know, one would need to do to, to find out the exact reasons for this. One would have to do more research, but. Mm. Uh, it seems to me that morphic resonance could easily be playing a part. So can we say that um, this theory of morphic resonance, it allows us to be um, consciously invo uh, involved with the evolution of our species and maybe the universal evolution? Well, I think we're consciously involved with evolution anyway. <laughs> um, morphic resonance is a theory that says that um, habits spread and uh, the more often something's done, the easier it becomes to do again. Um, uh, but it doesn't have a built-in moral filter. I mean, bad habits can spread as well as good habits. Um, so uh, it does mean that we have to be more responsible because it means that the way we behave can in influence other people, even if they're people somewhere else that we've never met and will never meet. Mm -hmm. um, I would uh, slightly deviate from the idea I had. Uh, this question is um, what I remember that I wanted to ask you. It's about perception. You know, the ordinary model in the mm, current Western society is that uh, all of that we have here, like mm. in this phenomenology of our perception, it's a model simulated in the matrix of our brain. And you proposed quite a different idea that actually it's not uh, inside the brain and we don't have this double image. Um, mm. Can you just describe it? Because I find it very fascinating and uh, true to my intuition as well. Yes, this is the idea of the extended mind. For example, the, as you say, the official view is that when I see you now, inside my head is a little image of Eugene, and it's, it's somewhere inside my a virtual reality display, inside my brain. No one has ever seen these virtual reality displays inside heads with full color and 3D. Um, but nevertheless, the official view is that somewhere there must be a virtual reality display inside my head. I think what's happening is quite different. I think that the light from you comes into my eyes, changes the um, cells and the inverted images and the from the lens, changes the cells and the retina impulses go up to the optic nerve, changes happen in the brain, 
Everyone agrees about that. That's uncontroversial. But the next stage is the official theory that an image of you appears in my brain. My view is different. I think I construct an image of you, but it's not inside my brain. It's where it seems to be. I project it out. So I'm projecting out my image of you to where you actually are. It's coinciding with where you actually are. If I put a mirror in the way, then I still project out the image. And because it's not physical in the same way that light is, it goes straight through the mirror. So when we look in the mirror, what we're seeing are these projections that our mind is projecting out all the time. Now, this is not simply a philosophical proposition or playing with words. Uh, it's a testable scientific hypothesis. So if I'm projecting out an image of you to coincide with where you are, my mind, in a sense, is touching you. Now, if you had your back to me, you didn't know I was there, I could still touch you with your, my mind, and you might feel I was there, if my mind really is reaching out from the brain. That might mean that you could actually feel when I was looking at you. And it turns out that this is an extremely common experience. Most people, including most children, have had the experience of feeling they're being looked at from behind. They turn around and someone's looking at them, or else they stare at someone from behind and that person will turn around. I've done many experiments on this, and so have other scientists, uh, and this is a real phenomenon. Everyone knows about it, but within the scientific world, everyone pretends it doesn't exist. So we have an extraordinary gap here between common sense, what everybody knows everywhere in the world, all children know this too, or almost all children. And the official view within science, a complete pretense that this is impossible, it doesn't happen, it cannot happen, because all images are inside the brain and the mind cannot stretch out from beyond the, the brain. I think our minds stretch out beyond our brains all the time. And I think the mind is best thought of as a ser series of fields. They're rooted in the brain, but they stretch beyond it. The field of a magnet is rooted in the magnet, but it stretches invisibly beyond the magnet. The field of the gravitational field of the Earth is in the Earth, but it stretches out far beyond the Earth. It keeps the moon in its orbit. The field of a mobile telephone is an electromagnetic field inside the phone, but stretches invisibly all around it. And I think our minds are fields, of the perceptual fields, for example, involved in vision, are inside our brains but stretch out beyond them. And as soon as one recognizes that the mind is extended beyond the brain, in ordinary perception, in every act of vision, not just by people, but by all animals that have image-forming eyes, uh, then one realizes that the materialist view, it's all in the brain, is extremely limited. In fact, it's a dogmatic assumption. It's not been proved by science at all. It's simply an assumption. And everything else in physical nature is based on fields, atoms, molecules, gravitation, magnetism, radio, or light. All these things are field phenomena. So scientists have got stuck in a kind of 19th century pre-field theory of the brain, that is just a mechanical system operating locally. Um, it's just such an old fashioned view and it's completely in conflict with our own most immediate experience. I just read in your new book, Ways to Go Beyond, you refer to uh, this uh, buffered uh, self phenomenon that uh, previously, probably in history, pe people's consciousness was more porous, and now it's um, due to some development psychologically became more self isolated and buffered. And you probably try, uh, you think that it could be related that um, the scientists or people who are um, investing themselves in this belief are some kind of in this uh, defense mode of defending their self-isolated buffer itself. Well, I think so, yes. I mean, in, in, in traditional societies, people assume that their minds are open. They're open to God, to gods, to spirits, um, and to each other, which is why they can pick up other people's thoughts telepathically. This is taken for granted in traditional societies. It's even taken for granted by most people in modern societies, except they don't dare to talk about it if they enter a university or a scientific institute. Um, even most scientists have this experience, but again, they won't talk about it to their colleagues because there's a taboo. They realize that 
this will get them into trouble. So they have to pretend these things don't exist. So um, <coughs> the, um, I think really it comes from the Enlightenment and the, the growth of materialism, the idea that the self is completely separate. The brains are separate, therefore the self is separate. Telepathy cannot exist according to this theory. The mind is shut up inside the brain. And this leads to a social theory of extreme individualism and social atomism. Each of us is isolated inside our own brain. Um, and um, this is a non-traditional view. It's the view of modern secular society. And I think that uh, some people, are, I think most people know they're supposed to believe this when they're at work or when they're at university or when they're in school but actually they don't really believe it at all. And as soon as they go home in the evening, you know, they, their dog may know when they're coming home, picking it up telepathically. They have a close bond with their children or their partners. Uh, uh, there are all these connections. They're well aware they're not just isolated units, but they have to pretend they are. Um, and those who really believe it, um, I think, uh, are likely to become very depressed because it's an extremely depressing and isolating view. I think that's one of the reasons why depression is one of the main mental problems in uh, modern secular societies, uh, this sense of isolation, which is, comes from this theory of the nature of the mind. Um, so, in fact, in practice, uh, most people don't really believe it. But those who do believe it find any threat to this view of their self-image very frightening. And the idea that somebody could read their thoughts telepathically or that they might be transparent to higher forms of consciousness is very frightening. They want to have this private, shut-up, secret life, even though it makes them unhappy. Um, mm. So the defense, the so-called skeptical arguments against psychic phenomena are usually based on fear and ignorance. And most of the skeptics I meet who say these things don't exist have never looked at the evidence. They're not actually interested in the evidence because they think they know the truth already. So here we come to um, uh, the ideas of your one of the recent and, you, as you mentioned, you think, uh, essential books, The Science Delusion, the... Mm -hmm. Title itself is probably a pun intended uh, for the Richard Dawkins' uh, The God Delusion mm -hmm. book. And in America, it's published as uh, Science Set Free. So what is the main message of that book? Well, the main message is setting science free. I mean, I prefer the American title. My English publishers insisted <laughs> on a title that related to Dawkins' book because they said it would sell more copies. They're probably right. Um, But uh, what I do in that book is take the ten dogmas of contemporary science. The mind is in the brain, the laws of nature are fixed. We've already discussed these two dogmas. And I show that they don't fit with the scientific evidence, that in fact science has outgrown these dogmas. And that by persisting with these dogmas, science itself is being constricted and inhibited. And that if we let go of these dogmas, we could have a much more interesting and exciting kind of science. So I'm pro-science, not anti-science. I spent my whole career doing scientific research. Most of my time is spent doing experiments and organizing empirical research. Um, so, but I just think these dogmas restrict it. For example, if you believe the mind is nothing but the brain, that telepathy and all these phenomena are impossible then you don't do research on them. So you've learned nothing. If you think they are possible, then you do do research on them. And you may find that a lot of animal behavior is coordinated telepathically, that flocks of birds are related to each other through fields, um, uh, that a whole amount, of, a lot of the natural world can be explained in a new way. But you'll never do that if you have this dogma. Um, so the, uh, and it, it, If the laws of nature evolve, if the habits of nature evolve, you'll never study how they do that or how the memory of nature builds up. If you say this is impossible, we must never do this kind of research. There will be no funding for it. Anyone who does it will lose their job. That's the situation today. Um, so these dogmatic assumptions are actually restricting the growth of science and our understanding of nature. And they lead uh, 
to the predominance of a false view of human minds, of human nature, of the nature of the earth and the nature of life. And this false view is one, one of its consequences, I think, is the climate crisis and, and the ecological crisis. We have a, a false view of nature and our whole civilization is based on that false view at the moment. And the results are increasingly disastrous. Mm -hmm. So, uh, several years ago, <coughs> um, you gave a TEDx uh, talk on uh, the topic of this book, The Science Delusion or Science Set Free, mm. and it was banned. Yes, the talk went on the normal TED website. Yeah. Um, but then there were some objections from um, some American evolutionary biologists who were both followers of Richard Dawkins. Both of them are militant atheists and um, militant materialists. And they uh, attacked the TED organization. They didn't really argue with me. Uh, they, this is how skeptics work. They don't argue. They don't want to engage with the arguments. They attacked the organization. They said they discredited their organization by allowing me to speak on it. Uh, and therefore, uh, to regain credibility, they should get rid of this video by me. The people who ran the TED organization don't know anything about science. And they panicked to hear these important professors saying this is rubbish. And, and, and they frightened, they bullied them. This is how they work. They bullied them, so they took it down and then it caused a tremendous amount of uh, controversy. And actually, uh, in a way, they did me a good turn because the, before the talk was banned, it had 35,000 views. It's now had about 7 million. And so um, this is, uh, controversies are actually important. I mean, I don't go out of my way to start fights, but um, the, but the, the controversies are one of the ways in which debates can spread through society. If there's no controversy, people don't notice. Um, but I think that the, the fact they felt so threatened by this talk, you see, is, it, I think just reinforces the view that they're really believers in a dogmatic belief system, which has run out of real arguments and now has to rely on threats and bullying. So to make this connection, in, in Russia, Richard Dawkins' books are, of course, published, and the idea of selfish gene is somewhat, uh, maybe not significant, but it's there. So what can be your comment about this idea, and is it uh, how you can approach it in a more, you know, in a more sane way? Well, I think, the, the first of all, the idea of the selfish gene, Dawkins himself admits, is a metaphor. Genes are molecules. DNA is a molecule. A molecule can't be selfish or loving or kind. This is, this is projecting human emotions onto molecules. It's turning these molecules into a kind of cartoon figures. In fact, what it is really is a form of vitalism. It, I think the problem with Dawkins is not that he's a genuine mechanist, but he's a crypto-vitalist. Uh, vitalists are people who believe that living organisms are controlled by animating principles which have mental qualities. And this is exactly what he does with genes. He endows them with selfishness, ambition, ruthlessness, uh, competitiveness, uh, all the qualities of neoliberal capitalism uh, projected onto these genes. Uh, which and So I, it's really a form of molecular vitalism. Um, the rhetoric is completely different from the actual reality, the molecular reality. And Dawkins' book is really a triumph of rhetoric, not of science. Um, so that's the first point. It's not really mechanistic at all. Uh, the entire force of the rhetoric is vitalist. Secondly, um, Neo-Darwinism, the doctrine that he's so keen on, um, which said that the whole of evolution ultimately depends on random mutations in genes and then on natural selection, uh, where gene genetic changes are the main source of innovation. This is now being completely superseded by the epigenetic revolution, which started around the year 2000. Um, and uh, we now know that the inheritance of acquired characteristics, which was the biggest taboo in science in the West in the 20th century, 
but interestingly was promoted in Russia under T.D. Lysenko. Um, the, this idea of the inheritance of acquired characters is now mainstream. In fact, it's the most exciting area of biology, epigenetic inheritance. This means that organisms can re respond creatively, adapt to the environment, or animals can respond creatively in their behavior. And this can then be passed on in many cases to their offspring, enabling evolution to happen much faster than waiting hundreds of generations for a random mutation. This reopens a whole debate, which was actually the most bitter debate in 20th century biology. And I'm sure this debate is going on in Russia because in some ways Lysenko was right. And um, then, of course, it brings in a whole political and polemical baggage, you know, Stalin, uh, the, the persecution of geneticists, this is a massively political issue. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hoping to do, and in fact, what I'm doing at the moment, is I'm, 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 some Russian-speaking friends of mine are buying Soviet-era biology textbooks, mm -hmm. which of course are very cheap. Um, and what we're doing is looking through them to see examples of inheritance of acquired characters from Soviet biology, not Lysenko himself, because the minute you mention the word Lysenko, there's an instant controversy and it's all political. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in the biological facts, not in the political controversy. Um, it's to me inconceivable that tens of thousands of biologists in the Soviet Union could all have been wrong, and that when they were studying the inheritance of acquired characteristics, everything they did was false. That's the usual assumption in the West. I think there may be a gold mine in the Russian scientific literature waiting to be discovered, and I'm trying to find out the, the examples from textbooks to see if I can see new examples that aren't widely known. I don't know if there are many examples that aren't widely known already, but I think it's very important to look, and this actually, this search would be best be done within Russia itself. Uh, true. The uh, Soviet science has some interesting um, advancements in consciousness studies, for instance, mm. and uh, other areas which are yet to be revealed, probably, and rediscovered and revisioned. So our interview is coming to a conclusion, probably uh, two last questions. One of them is, um, uh, in your younger years, you've been living in uh, India, doing work um, as a biologist, right? Mm. And uh, you mentioned in uh, your biographic, biographical um, essays and uh, chapters that you've been, you, you've known uh, Father Bean uh, Griffiths. And um, for, for the Russian audiences, who was he and what was your relationship with him? Well, first I was in uh, India because I was working in an international agricultural research institute. I was the principal plant physiologist in ICRASAT, the International Crops Research Institute in India. When I was in India, I was interested in yoga, meditation, Hindu philosophy. Um, and to my surprise, um, through that, I, when I went to India, I was still very influenced by the materialist and atheist worldview that I'd been educated in. Um, through this interest in Eastern philosophy, uh, meditation and yoga, um, I became curious about spiritual paths in general and surprisingly found myself drawn back to a Christian path. Um, I then found this um, English Benedictine monk living in a small ashram in a village in South India, Father B. Griffiths. He'd been in India for 30 years and was building bridges between a deep mystical Christian understanding from the Christian mystics and from the Russian, uh, no, sorry, I mean Indian uh, mystical tradition. And in his ashram, it was bringing together Eastern and Western approaches to understanding the world of the spirit and ultimate reality. For me, this was perfect because I, I wanted to find a way of integrating Eastern and Western thinking. Um, I wanted to find a way of integrating the spiritual insights of Eastern cultures with the Christian tradition, because I felt for me, having grown up in England, 
it's more appropriate to follow a Christian path than a Buddhist or Hindu or Sufi path. Um, more in tune with my ancestors, more in tune with the tradition of my culture. But I had to find a way of doing it that made sense, that was meaningful, and that reconnected with the deep spiritual insights um, of uh, the monastic tradition, the mystical tradition within Christianity. Um, I'm not a Roman Catholic, I'm an Anglican, um, a member of the Church of England. Um, but Father Bede's uh, teachings were enormously helpful to me. And I wrote my first book, A New Science of Life, about morphic resonance while I was living in his ashram. Um, he provided a very quiet and restful and supportive community in which I could live while I wrote that book. So I wasn't just sitting, I was meditating and doing yoga when I was there and attending services and chanting and so on. But the rest of the time I was writing a book um, and it was the perfect place to write it. So uh, for me, it was a perfect combination of a quiet place, bringing together of ideas, you know, scientific work, living in rural India very simply. Um, it was one of the happiest times of my life, in fact. You describe yourself being in your younger years uh, an atheist, mm -hmm. having an atheistic mm -hmm. mindset. And um, the last question probably for this interview is, um, um, can you describe uh, one or two peak experiences or spiritual experiences? Uh, one of them could be from childhood if you had any, and one from more adult life, uh, like your first person experience, which usually makes this sort of transformation or conversion from more atheistic background to a more like uh, open uh, mindset. Mm. I think, for me, a very important one was uh, when I was a child. Um, uh, the, my family, my grandmother's family, were willow farmers. They grew willows for producing sticks for making wicker baskets um, in a village on the bank of a river. And I was staying with my great aunt, who still had the family willow farm when I was a young child. And I saw a fence made of sticks, posts, um, on their farm. And the fence had come to life. These posts had taken root and shoots were coming. They turned into willow trees. Um, and for me, that had a huge effect. Something that was dead and mechanical had turned into something that was alive. And it, it gave me this really powerful sense of the life of nature. That's one reason I started questioning orthodox biology that says plants sense of connection with nature from a child uh, and the sense of something dead and mechanical coming to life again and in a way most of my scientific work is about this trying to move beyond the mechanistic materialist worldview where nature is dead mechanical and machine-like to seeing nature as organic and alive so that's one another one happened around 1970 71 when I was an atheist, I'd been educated to believe the mind's nothing but the brain, and a friend in Cambridge gave me some LSD. So I had this incredibly powerful psychedelic experience, which nothing in my education had prepared me for. Um, uh, the realms of consciousness that were revealed to me, the, uh, the experiences I went through were not on any map that I had been given. And this gave me a very uh, increased interest in the nature of consciousness. What are minds? How do they work? If, you know, none of this fitted into the physiology I'd learned about nerve impulses and neurotransmitters. Obviously, nerve impulses were involved, and obviously LSD is a chemical that was affecting the chemistry of the brain. That's obviously true, but it didn't seem a, a sufficient explanation for the amazing revelations I was experiencing. Um, and this, for me, created a uh, feeling first that our understanding of the nature of minds and of consciousness is extremely limited, and I became curious to find out more. Then I started doing transcendental meditation because I wanted to be able to explore the nature of minds and direct experience without uh, drugs. Um, 
and I've been meditating on and off ever since then. Um, so that for me was an enormously uh, opening experience. And I think in fact for many people today who take psychedelics, it, some, for some people it's disastrous. It causes psychotic episodes and triggers off schizophrenia or something if they're in that way. It may push, push them over the edge. But for many people, um, just like for me, it's like a rite of passage, an opening up of a whole new realm of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so that, for me, was a, a great revelation. And in my most recent book, um, Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, I discuss how psychedelics can act as, as spiritual, spiritual openings for people. Mm -hmm. I think for many people in the modern world, they do. Of course, I have to note here that uh, in Russia they are still uh, prohibited, even though there is a growing wave of research in some countries such as the United States and Switzerland. And there was a tradition of psychoactive substance research in the Soviet Union. While the laws are strict, uh, yet the science uh, moves on. Can you speak anything about lucid dreaming? I haven't uh, had many lucid dreams myself. I've read books on it. I know there's a re research on lucid dreams. Um, personally, I find the whole subject very interesting. Um, and if I had more discipline at night, uh, I would start writing my dreams down and practicing um, how to do it. Um, I think it can. it's another way of exploring the realm of consciousness. And in the Tibetan tradition, they do dream yoga because they think it's one of the best ways of understanding how the mind works and, and, and being able to control the mind in the otherwise chaotic conditions of dreams. And since they think that when you die, you enter a dreamlike state, I think that too, um, having practice in how to deal with this is very helpful. So I see lucid dreaming as a, a fascinating area of inquiry and experience. I think it's important that in the modern world, interesting that so many people are becoming interested in it. And it's an area of consciousness studies, which is only just begun. Uh, but I think that there's a lot further to go in finding out about dreams and the mind through lucid dreaming. Do you think that uh, our dreams happen inside our head and are a simulation or to this extent that consciousness can be related to this as well? I think that our dreams uh, that maybe are rooted in brain activity, like all our experience when we're uh, alive. Um, but there's no reason to assume that the dreams themselves are located inside our head, any more than our visual experiences inside our heads. Um, so um, traditionally, in traditional cultures, people have thought when they dream, they're traveling out of their body. And actually, that's what it feels like when you're dreaming. You're not dreaming of yourself lying in bed asleep. You're dreaming of yourself walking around, talking and doing things. You have another body in your dreams, um, the dream body. Um, uh, you, so you have a whole other life in your dreams, which is not like your waking life in many ways. Um, so uh, where this is, is in a, it's in a mental realm. It's in a, obviously in a world of experience. I don't see any reason to assume that it's got to be inside the brain. From materialist, it has to be. There's no question. Everything must be in the brain. That's a dogmatic assumption. I don't see any reason to believe it. Do you think we can connect with other people in dreams? I think there's no doubt we can connect with other people in dreams. The mm -hmm. Many ex dream experiments have shown that dream telepathy is possible, for example. You can pick up images or thoughts from someone uh, while you're dreaming. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for dream telepathy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, quite a lot of people have spontaneous experiences of connecting with others in dreams. And also like premonition dreams and precognitive dreams. Yes. Well, then that's a whole other subject. We'd better yeah. not get into that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, these experiences and thank you for this interview and your wonderful hospitality. And I hope to uh, be able to help in spreading the news about your theories and ideas in Russia. Good, very good to be with you. Mm -hmm.